Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to this live stream. I'm so excited to have Dr. Paul Nelson back after his stint in the gulag. <laughs> That's an internal <laughs> joke. <laughs> so um, Paul Nelson is free to do a live stream back on the channel. A lot of people have been enjoying the content over the past two years now. And we're going to do something special today. We're actually going to be speaking about the implications of orphan genes and the and other taxonomically restricted genes on design and common descent part one of three so this is going to be a new playlist on the channel <laughs> and uh, i am sure a lot of people are never going to hear this content except on this channel right now this is some rare stuff as you can see 16th of march um, Paul, am I right in saying that this stuff is not out there? This is not your stuff which you've published or this is not uh, this is all new material. Um, and I can tell you that in the three parts of this series, the the interest factor will will grow. So um, the the first one is interesting, I think. I mean, I put the talk together, but by the time we get to part three, there are going to be some really remarkable implications from uh, the data that I'll, I'll be presenting. And uh, it's, it's amazing to me that over the past 20 years, orphan genes have gone from sort of a puzzling anomaly on the fringe of comparative biology yep. right to the very center. So some of the brightest young people in the field are now, are now working on these puzzles and and uh, these new data. So um, it, we're going to build to a crescendo, I guess you can say, in part three. And this is all new material. I've not presented this before. Brilliant. Brilliant. So I'm excited. Let's get started. Okay. So part one, I've subtitled The Inherent Instability of the Evolutionary Definition of Homology. This is a problem within evolutionary theory that goes very deep, right to the, uh, the, the core principles of the theory. And it's something that many researchers have, have sort of nibbled around the edges of the problem, but they haven't really gone into it in depth. And over the next 45 to 60 minutes, uh, and I hope to leave a little time for Q&A at the end, I'll explore some of the dimensions of what I'm calling the inherent instability. So uh, Kara Weissman is a postdoctoral scholar at Princeton. And next time I'm going to talk about this paper that she published in PLOS Biology last year, uh, reflecting uh, work done in her, her Harvard dissertation that provides a much needed advance in the field of orphan genes research. Uh, this field is very young. I mean, really about 20 years old, and it's a bit of an unruly adolescent. Uh, and starting now finally to settle down with some uh, widely accepted definitions and criteria, uh, for instance, for identifying orphans. And Kara's work provides a real advance in this area. So I want to talk about it, but I want to do that next time after pointing out that the problems that she considers in this paper and in her Harvard PhD uh, really go much deeper. Uh, and as, as I said, they go right to the core of key principles in evolutionary theory. And you can see that in this uh, little Twitter survey done by uh, Claudio Casola last fall, um, uh, you know, on, on his Twitter feed, he threw up this survey asking, is it the case that most existing genes descend from genes that were already present in Luca, the last universal common ancestor? Now, what's striking about this is look at the division of opinion. You've got uh, a, a very pronounced three-way bifurcation or trifurcation of opinion on something that really ought to have only one answer. Uh, but you've got some people saying true, others saying false, and uh, a large group saying they don't know. All right, 151 votes, that's a pretty good sample of opinion. It's, it is remarkable, I think, 
that in 2022, now 2023, of course, you can have this question be put up in a Twitter uh, in a Twitter feed and get this range of, of opinion, which means the field has a giant question mark at its at its center. So here's my outline, just to let you know where we're going in part one today. We'll start with some basic concepts. In particular, we're going to ask what biological concept contrasts logically with homology? Then we'll look at a claim made by Darwin in The Origin of Species, namely that propinquity of descent of material relationship is the only known cause of similarity among living things, uh, which uh, to a remarkable extent still holds today, I think, for many biologists, and so we'll, we'll probe that. Uh, then a claim uh, made by the systematic biologist Michael Gieselin uh, in a, a chapter he published in the 70s that I read as a graduate student, and it really shocked me uh, in a good way. It, it, it bumped my thinking, and I, I began to think about these topics in a different way after reading this chapter from Gieselin, where he says, entities are homologous however different they become. Uh, which to me, I'm, when I first read it, I was scandalized by that by that claim. And lastly, and this is probably the most novel respect of this talk, we'll, we'll ask what happens when homology, when an inference of homology arrives at what I call the origins horizon. Uh, and that's, that's how we'll finish uh, part one today. In part two, we'll look uh, at Kara's work, beginning with Molecular similarity and the original rationale of BLAST, which is the most widely used uh, algorithm in uh, systematic biology for comparing gene and protein sequences. There are many different flavors of BLAST. That acronym stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool, uh, a, a tool that almost any comparative biologist will use at some point uh, in his or her work. We will examine in particular uh, a parameter in BLAST called the E value, the expect value, and how that relates to the definition of orphan genes as, bio, as a biological convention. Then we'll look at Kara's critique of standard E value thresholds. Uh, in, uh, <clears throat> I won't spend any time on this today, but basically, an E value cutoff is the line. Uh, drawn to separate a gene that exhibits homology or a protein that exhibits homology with another sequence versus something that is an orphan or apparently unique in sequence space. And then we'll conclude part two with what I'm calling the sandy foundations of homology determination in evolutionary theory. So those are the first two parts. In part three, as I said a moment ago, we're going to look at what I find incredibly exciting. Uh, some of the developments at the frontiers of this field. So stay tuned for that. All right. One, after 1859, what biological concept became the logical opposite of homology? So homology today is defined this way, post-Darwin. <laughs> Two or N, three, whatever that, four, whatever that number happens to be. Entities are homologous if and only if they share a common ancestor via material descent. So in the cartoon here, we have sequence X as the common ancestor of sequences A and B. And this is textbook orthodoxy. So if you uh, uh, open a biology textbook or a textbook on evolutionary theory, or in fact, just go to wiki, right? This is the definition you will get for when two or n entities, whether they're genes or proteins or anatomical structures, they're homologous if and only if they share a common ancestor. Now, what happened with Darwin is homology, of course, was known uh, and being mapped uh, well before Darwin, really all the way back to Linnaeus or further back in time. Homology was known as a phenomenon. What Darwin did is he gave it a causal uh, causal account, descent, descent with modification. And what happened then is 
the cause of homology was incorporated into the definition of homology. Uh, and that creates some logical problems, as we'll see in a moment. But just keep that in mind, that the cause of homology, as hypothesized by Darwin, then in the uh, late 19th century and into the 20th century, that became incorporated into the definition of the term. So here is a very important point, and we'll come back to it at the end. But I'm giving it to you now so you'll be conscious of it as we go through the material. This is what you never want to do in a science, or even in daily life, I guess, for that matter. You do not want to employ logically opposed propositions in your theory, right? You do not want to assert contradictions here, A and not A. So here are some examples from science. You, you do, if you're in doing physics, you do not want to say that there's an absolute frame of reference that exists. And by the way, it does not exist. Or in biology, organismal inheritance is blending. And by the way, it's discrete. Or if you're a planetary geologist, the continents are immobile and also they move. The problem with asserting contradictions is anything will follow from a contradiction. And it is impossible to construct a science starting with contradictions. You do not want to rest your science on a foundation of contradictions. It's an essential logical point <coughs> that I'm putting up here now so that you'll be conscious of it as we go through the material and then we'll come back to it at the end. So that you can think of as the precipice over which we do not want to tumble. Uh, we're, and we're thinking in this talk now as evolutionary biologists, we do not want to be in the position of asserting contradictions. Okay, <clears throat> so what happened in 1859 with respect, as I said, to the definition of homology and its contrastive partner? Well, the explanations, that is a, a term in the philosophy of science for the thing that explains. Typically, that's going to be some kind of cause, right? Uh, it is the explainer. It's the thing that is going to do the work of, of associating a cause with a particular effect, which is known as the explanandum. This is philosophy of science 101. You learn these terms very on if you study philosophy of science. So we have the thing that is explaining. And again, I, as I said, it's typically some kind of cause versus the explanandum, which is the pattern or object that you wish to explain. So what happens with Darwin is the explanandum was known. We can go all the way back to the uh, early decades of the 18th century in the work of Linnaeus, where he constructs hierarchical classifications of groups within groups. So those data are already on the table, so to speak. And 120 years later, Darwin comes along and he says, well, before we get there, here is a, a very nice cartoon of the hierarchical groups within groups pattern as laid out by Linnaeus and, and, and then continuing right down to the present. It's remarkable that this logical uh, structure of nested groups comes from Linnaeus all the way down to 2023, really where we have the most inclusive group here, the domain, and we work our way down to the species. And there is, of course, a rational logic underlying this method of, of organizing groups within groups. But this should be familiar to anyone who's had any, any training really in biology. So we have the explanandum on the table. There are the, the living things of the earth fall into this nested hierarchy of groups within groups. Darwin says, I've got a cause for that. I can explain this explanandum via descent with modification. It's one of the key arguments in the origin of species, as you know. Um, and then what happens is because the explanandum is organized in terms of homologies, so for the chordates, a chordate by definition is an animal possessing an, a dorsal nerve cord. Uh, <clears throat> within the chordates, and we have the vertebrates that have a bony 
uh, vertebral structure. And, and you work your way through these nested groups right on down to Homo sapiens or Pantroglodytes or pick your favorite Linnaean binomial. That will be nested within a, a, a increasingly inclusive set of groups. Darwin says the reason you see that pattern that Linnaeus uncovered is because of descent with modification. And ergo, homology is then defined as being caused by common descent. And this was a, a, a major uh, achievement of Darwin to, to have done this. And Ronald Brady, who I got to know a little bit uh, uh, when I was a graduate student, we corresponded back and forth. And he, uh, unfortunately, uh, I wish he were with us today. He died uh, really before he could fulfill his career as a philosopher of science. But he wrote a number of papers that I found very, very helpful. And in fact, when I send the references uh, for this talk to Subor to attach to the YouTube file, I'll put in some of Brady's best papers, really a very insightful philosopher. Brady points out as he's looking at this timeline, this was considered a major achievement by Darwin's contemporaries to have provided apparently a cause for the groups within groups pattern. So what are we going to do now? We're going to put a negation sign in front of homology to see if we can get a, a clear picture of its logically symmetrical or contrastive concept. So there's our negation sign in red in front of homology. Similarity due to common ancestry from a shared material progenitor. The negation sign gives us homoplasy, which is the technical term within systematics for similarity not due to common ancestry from a shared progenitor. Now, homoplasy is in a sense the enemy of phylogenetic reconstruction. That is attempting to reconstruct the history of life because it gives you misleading signals. What you want as you're building your tree of life is homology because that will let you connect groups together. Homoplasy is similarity but it is not similarity due to common ancestry. So homoplasy is, uh, I think without question, the enemy of phylogenetic reconstruction as a project. It's something to be, to be sifted out analytically from the data of comparative biology at every level, from molecular to anatomical, uh, right on up to the, you know, the full panoply of different types of data that you would have in phylogenetic reconstruction. You want to avoid homoplasy and minimize it in your inferences. So there's our contrast class. Now, remember what we want to avoid. And this will be the problem that we are going to work our way back towards as this talk goes on. To keep evolutionary theory from resting on a contradiction where we assert A and not A about some phenomenon, we need to keep these two terms from collapsing into each other. This is critically important because if we find at the end of the day that our theoretical commitments require us to take that red dividing line out, in other words, if homology and homoplasy begin to collapse into each other as concepts, we are going to have a deeply confused science. Uh, and I think there's probably no more important slide in this talk than the one you're looking at right now. Homology and homoplasy need to be kept distinct, and we cannot apply them both to the same phenomenon without asserting a contradiction. And the thesis of this part one, my argument is, given the fundamentally conflict conflicting commitments of naturalistic biology, that is biology where Everything is going to happen via undirected physical process. There will be no mind. There will be no intelligence. There will be no teleology. It's biology as we understand it post-Darwin. There are fundamentally conflicting commitments within that program of explanation that may make it impossible for us to keep these two terms separate. And they end up collapsing into each other. And that may be unavoidable. So that's my thesis. But here's a little cartoon uh, to uh, illustrate this 
this definition or these definitions, one for homology, one for homoplasy, in a way that ought to be intuitively clear to you, right? So here we have X as our common ancestor for A and B. Here, the, the common ancestors do not exist, or the, the common ancestor to these two sequences do not exist. These, these causal lineages run back to independent starting points. So at this level of analysis, this should be clear and obvious, right? It's if you either got common ancestry or you don't. And as I'll argue, what, what I think I'll be able to show you is these end up collapsing into each other in a way that's really pernicious. All right, let's look now at Darwin's claim. Now, what's interesting about this claim is Darwin himself knew it to be false. In fact, if you go to the first edition of The Origin and look at the place where Darwin makes this claim, within a very few number of pages, he writes eloquently about why this is false. So this, when I was writing uh, on, on Darwin's uh, analysis of homology, it, it jumped off the page at me that within the space of a very few pages, he says this, propinquity of descent, common ancestry is the only known cause of the similarity of organic beings. And that phrase, only known cause, at the time, in the mid-19th century, the vera causa principle, that's the Latin tag for the true cause, was a very powerful uh, heuristic in a whole range of sciences, physics, right on up to natural history and biology, uh, as Darwin was practicing it. And you wanted, if you were an investigator, you really wanted to find the vera causa, the true cause of something. So only known cause is really the English equivalent of that Latin phrase vera causa, as articulated by Huell and others, of early philosophers of science of the, of the early to mid 19th century. So Darwin's making a very strong claim here, but what's so interesting is he knows it's not true. And that's something we can maybe come back to in the Q&A or at some other later point. But let's take it at face value. Because for many biologists today, uh, that Veracausa claim looks to them to be self-evidently the case. So here's my cartoon again. And what they would say is if the similarity of A and B, sequences A and B, let's say these are DNA sequences that we've sampled from two different species. If the similarity of those sequences, base pair by base pair, exceeds a certain threshold, probability dictates that they must share a common ancestor. And at, at the back of his or her mind, the biologist is saying, look, it's just not plausible that that degree of similarity could have arisen over here multiple times independently. So in a sense, that this claim of Darwin is sort of functioning in the background to do this, to tell you if you see similarity at this level, and remember, this is what we observe, down here is what we infer, Beyond a certain threshold, says my comparative biologist, looking at these gene sequences, this cannot be the case. And this intuition, to give it a name, is very powerful, very powerful, and runs all throughout comparative biology. It's the basis, for instance, of saying that endogenous retroviruses uh, are the, or, or excuse me, that Retroviral sequences were incorporated into the primate lineage uh, and are present throughout uh, the, the genomes of Homo sapiens and chimps and gorillas and so forth, uh, or that the very large RNAs that we find as the major elements of the ribosome must share common ancestry because that degree of similarity could not have happened multiple times independently. So it's a very powerful intuition. And you can go to the literature and find uh, biologists, the, uh, evolutionary biologists commenting on this. Uh, so uh, in the late 80s, there was a, a, a flurry of, of uh, debate about how to establish molecular homology 
uh, could you read that right off of similarity? And Gabriel Dover, the late uh, evolutionary biologist in the UK, weighed in on that controversy. And he said, look, most sequence similarity above the trivial level of coincidence, which would be, in this case, the alphabet of DNA, uh, ATCG gives you 25% percent a sort of background level of, of coincidence just because that's the chemical alphabet of the molecule that you're looking at. So that's what he means by trivial level of coincidence. He says, you rise above that 25%. And at some point, you're going to cross a threshold where you say it's got these sequences, whatever they are, have to have a common evolutionary origin. Why? Because probability dictates against the multiple independent origins of these similarities. All right. That's what he calls freak conditions. We have to postulate freak conditions counterintuitively against our probabilistic, uh, our probabilistic better judgment. Uh, and that's how we end up with asserting common ancestry. Molecular convergence doesn't happen. It just can't. Uh, Colin Patterson at the British Museum, very much at the same time, one year later, makes the same point. The argument from complexity is how he puts it. If two structures are complex enough and similar in detail, probability dictates that they must be homologous namely sharing common ancestry rather than convergent. Now, what flows from this is a great reliance on molecular similarity not to mislead us, uh, that it will, properly sifted, it will give us true homology, not homoplasy, and therefore give us true history. And we can use molecular sim similarities, therefore, to reconstruct the history of life bringing together different clades in terms of their shared molecular features. Okay, now, another key slide. Uh, maybe there's four or five of them in this talk, and this is one of them, okay? Here's the house of evolution. In the house of evolution, we have core theoretical notions, such as homology. We have inference rules about how to apply those core notions. And we have millions of observations, and they all need to live together and get along. All right. So we have a notion of biological descent, which is a very, really a notion peculiar to biology of begetting a mother giving birth to a child, one cell, a yeast cell dividing to two daughters, and so forth. Right. This relation of begetting is diagnostic of living things. And going well back into antiquity, it was characteristic of living things that they produced, like produces like, right? <coughs> yeast give you more yeast and so forth by this process of begetting. So this is biological descent. And you can think of it as templating off of a progenitor form, whether that's a gene sequence, whether that's a cellular phenotype and so forth, this is a uniquely biological causal relation. But if you go far enough back in the history of life, you are going to come to a point within the naturalistic program of explanation where your causes are not biological, they're physical, physical chemical. So the, the process of crystallization of quartz, let's say, will occur in multiple locations independently if the antecedent conditions are right. In fact, I can give you the recipe for quartz. Uh, you need uh, ions in solution in the right ratio, silicon, oxygen, ions in the right ratio in solution, and you can grow quartz. People do this, right? You can do it in your own kitchen if you have a pressure cooker in the, in the right uh, starting materials. So physical chemical causation does not uh, have the same spatiotemporal character as biological causation. But as you go back in the evolutionary story, you pass from the realm of biological causation to the realm of physical causation at the origin of life. Prior to the origin of cells, what's running the story is physics and chemistry, not biology. 
So these two modes of causation are going to bump up against each other in very interesting ways that can lead to contradictions. We'll come back to that. All right. You have millions of observations of similarity, and you have to sift them. Which are the ones that are homologies? Which are the ones that are homoplasies? How can I tell the difference between the two? And you have a commitment to a particular geometry of relationships. Now, that may be Darwin's single tree, right? The monophyletic single tree picture going back to Luca, the last universal common ancestor, or maybe not. So one of the things that's happened in my lifetime as a student of evolutionary theory is I have watched uh, uh, prominent evolutionary biologists who have no sympathy for intelligent design at all. I mean, they're, they're flat out opposed to intelligent design. Yet when they look at the, at the earliest stages of biological history on this planet, they say it's not a monophyletic tree. It's not a single uh, a single tree geometry. So you can see you've got a bunch of, of important commitments here that may not get along. <clears throat> and uh, I'll illustrate that. So I've shown this uh, I've shown this cartoon or this slide before. This is a multiple sequence alignment of an RNA or DNA sequence, excuse me. Uh, coding for an RNA, and uh, each of these uh, each of these rows is a separate population, and the columns show the regions of alignment. So you can see here, this is absolutely conserved among all these different populations of of uh, these these genes. You have very striking conservation here, just one difference here. And then uh, also conservation of a lot of base pairs on either side of this highly conserved region. All right, if you show this kind of alignment to a molecular evolutionist without any other background information, he doesn't know the backstory, chances are he or she is going to say these sequences share common ancestry. That degree of conservation is, it just cannot be explained by independent origins. It would be utterly implausible. Okay. The, 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 the backstory, though, is very interesting. If we apply, before we get to the backstory, if we apply the principle that Darwin articulated, that again, he knew to be false, right? Uh, but as it comes into 20th century biology and the work of people like Patterson and others, and frankly, textbook authority, if we apply this principle, we would get exactly the wrong answer for the origin of this pattern, of this multiple sequence alignment. Because propinquity of descent is not the only known cause of biological similarity, similarity, excuse me, not by a long shot. So this multiple sequence alignment, which I showed you, comes from the work of Jack Shostak and his colleagues in a fascinating paper that I've recommended before, I think, uh, in some of these talks uh, uh, with Subor, published in Nature in 2001, where they observed the hammerhead ribozyme. So this is the secondary structure that comes from this, uh, this primary sequence. This motif, uh, showed up in lots of different groups that really had no phylogenetic connection to each other, other than all the way back to Luca, basically, right? So uh, they they performed to me a really interesting experiment. They said, can we artificially breed, so to speak, these sequences from large RNA populations if we select for the self-cleaving reaction that the hammerhead performs? So they set up an experiment where they had multiple independent populations of RNAs. And by chemical selection, they looked for that self-cleaving RNA structure. Here's the secondary structure here, the hammerhead motif. And they got it over and over and over again. So in their paper in Nature, they say evolutionary process may have been repeatedly channeled in Nature, as it was in our laboratory experiments, 
towards the repeated selection of the simplest solution, what we see here. So my, my cartoon here of a funnel indicates that causally you are being deterministically uh, driven towards the same outcome without there being material descent from a common ancestor. In effect, the chemistry or the biochemistry gives you a particular motif in a sense, whether you want it or not, it's going to be deterministically driven uh, to that outcome. So a mentor of mine, Lee Van Valen, said in, a, in an interesting publication in Nature in 1983, homology, that inference to common ancestry, is never something we observe, or very, very rarely, very rarely. What we observe is similarity or identity, never homology, and we infer homology. Now, at a deeper level, what you need to keep in mind is observe similarity, even identity. Those That multiple sequence alignment had regions of absolute identity of nucleotides from one sequence to the next. That does not tell us what causal process is responsible to explain the similarity we observe. So most biologists <coughs> who work on these kinds of puzzles will tend to assume that the initial causal pathway for the origin of sequence was a very small probability Markov chain that can be modeled probabilistically as a lottery cylinder, right? If this is a real lottery cylinder with no mischief and you've got numbered balls in there and you crank it, introducing a randomizing a, a causal process into your history, you pull out the balls one by one, write down the sequence, put them all back in, do it again. You will never recover the first sequence ever. All right. It's just, you're never going to see it again in the history of the universe. Right? So what that tells you is this assumption that the origin of your original progenitor was by us via some causal process that can be modeled probabilistically like this that's going to give you a very different history than what i would call the funnel model where you're deterministically heading towards a particular outcome as described here uh by uh by shostak and his uh his colleagues okay now why does this matter? It matters because as we go back in the history of life, our ability to describe, again, thinking as evolutionary biologists, as we go back in the history of life, our ability to discriminate between these two depends critically on what we know about the causal processes that may have been involved in giving rise to sequences. And it turns out that similarity as a phenomenon and common descent as a cause may have nothing to do with each other. <clears throat> if I go back to my living in the same house metaphor, they can live in the same house for many years at a time, never even speaking. Okay. So Douglas Theobald, uh, uh, who thinks about these questions very deeply, he's a biochemist at Brandeis. In a paper in 2011, he said, in RNA selection experiments, uh, you can have uh, so-called randomly arising aptamers. These are RNAs that will bind a, another molecule in a particular way. You can fish them out of a random sequence library and align them. And the alignments will show many conserved base pairs. <laughs> Yet, because you know that the populations were independent, they didn't share a common ancestor. So those regions of alignment do not represent homologous residues. So the apparent similarity of these sequences that you're aligning is giving you a misleading signal if you say similarity can only be explained by common descent. In fact, in this case, you don't have common descent. What you have is similarity, but the origin of that is from multiple independent causal pathways. Uh, so he says an alignment is not necessarily a proposal of homology because similar aligned sequences may be merely structurally or functionally analogous due to what he calls analogy. Now, if you take this seriously, and you should, 
and take this as a caveat and go back into the molecular evolution literature, what you will find is that people don't take this seriously. They are led around by the nose in many cases by high degrees of similarity. And what they do is they default to a small probability Markov chain as the cause and don't consider the full range of possible causes, which may be something like what Theobald is describing here. All right. I really have to speed up if we're going to finish on time. All right. Keep that in mind. And now let's go to this claim that shocked me. So picture Paul, graduate student, sitting in the University of Chicago Biology Library, reading Michael Giesland, and I see this claim from him. Entities are homologous, however different they become. There he is. He's at the California Academy of Sciences. And then the next phrase in that chapter is, what matters is continuity in, in an historical sequence. Like this. There's a historical sequence. You've got A to B and so forth, down to G. A pattern of transformation. Well, I was, I'll be honest, I was shocked and disgusted when I first read this because it seemed to me to be a case of what you could call neo Darwinian storytelling. Any damn thing can happen in evolution. You can loosen the link between similarity as observed phenomenon and descent as explanation. Doesn't matter. So I'm sitting there grumbling and reading this and thinking this is just another case of the laxity. The, the, uh, the lack of rigor in evolutionary theory where you can say, well, it doesn't matter if it's similar or not. What matters is continuity and historical sequence. Almost at the same time, late 1980s, I read or I'm studying metazoan embryogenesis, animal development. And I realize Giselin is right. He's actually right. And my initial shock was that I wasn't thinking deeply enough about what he was saying. So let me give you an example from another part of biology that I was studying. As I was thinking at homology at a theoretical level, I was also learning uh, animal development in detail. So here is a pluteus larva from an invertebrate group. Beautiful little larval form. Keep that shape in mind, okay? That pluteus larva, keep that in mind. And here is another larval form. It's an arthropod in this case. Keep that shape in mind. So think about these as geometries, three-dimensional geometries of animal form. Pluteus larva, uh, larval insect form. Now, hold those shapes in your mind and let's look at our definition of homology. You could say that before Darwin, homology was defined as essential similarity, and in many respects, it still is. Systematists who are trying to organize uh, previously unstudied groups of plants or animals, they will be looking for similarities as what is called sort of primary homology. That is the initial signal of similarity, some of which may be misleading, so you have to sift it. But as Gieselin said, it, what it really means is continuity in a begetting sequence of a material templating, parent to offspring to offspring and so forth. All right. Now, similarity as an observed phenomenon is a static mapping. It has many possible causes, only one of which is biological descent. So you have, in, in, if you think in terms of inference to the best explanation, if similarity is the phenomenon that you wish to explain, you cannot go directly from similarity to material descent because you have a range of other possibilities, chemical constraints, physical constraints that determine your outcome and so forth. We just saw that with the hammerhead ribozyme. Down here, however, Continuity in a, in a biological sequence of material templating, that is a dynamic pathway. It is not a static mapping. And it's a dynamic pathway with only one cause, namely biological templating. The mother yeast cell templates the two daughters. The E. coli templates two daughters. Uh, I, 
you know, got, I can see birds out in my backyard here in Chicago. The Cardinal, the two, the male and female Cardinal template, they're fledglings, their offspring. Okay. And the endpoints are not in doubt in that sequence. So here are the larval forms. And let's now look at what they turn into. There's a sand dollar, five-fold echinoderm, five-fold symmetry of an echinoderm. That's the adult. And that larval form will give rise to a ladybug. There's really relatively little similarity between these. In case of the pluteus larva, there's almost none at all, right? If I showed you the pluteus larva and you didn't know, you hadn't had any invertebrate zoology, you didn't know where it was going, right? It's, it's a larval form, so it's going to undergo metamorphosis. You would have a very hard time. In fact, I would say it's impossible to predict the adult structure. In the case of the ladybug uh, larva, if you didn't know any entomology, if you had never studied arthropod uh, uh, arthropod groups, you would have a very hard time predicting what it's going to turn into. Now, the key point to keep in mind about this, this, this continuity of begetting, is you need to be able to observe the endpoints. You've got to be able to put the adult together with the larva in both of these cases, and you can't guess at it. You need to have direct observation to be able to establish these pathways of transformation. So Gieselin is right in saying what matters is continuity in a pathway of transformation. But the only way you can assert that there was a pathway of transformation is if you have observational access to it. You've got to be able to see it. All right. Now. This becomes a problem when we look at things like proteins, because the origin of proteins is a question mark. The original origin of proteins, the proteins that give us the cellular state, is a question mark. Now, I want to refer to a paper by George, John Maynard Smith, published in 1970 in Nature. Interestingly, that was published actually in response to a design argument, an intelligent design argument by a biologist at Utah State University. It's a case of intelligent design provoking uh, an interesting evolutionary theoretical development. What Maynard Smith is going to do is use the transformation of English words as an illustration or an analogy for how evolution functions. So let's take two words that appear to have no relation to each other as symbol strings, tame and cord. Now, these seem to be quite a distance from each other in natural language. Well, Maynard Smith says, no worries. We can transform tame into cord in a step-by-step -step way and uh, support the claim of Gieselin that entities are homologous, however different they become. So you would agree with me, tame and cord are very different English words. You know, located you know hundreds of pages apart in a dictionary, all right? But Maynard Smith says, look, just change one letter at a time, and you can transform tame into cord in a stepwise fashion, which I've illustrated here in, in the cartoon. Now, this paper was highly influential. Uh, if you go to Google Scholar, you'll get almost a thousand citations, including many from leading theoreticians in protein evolution. And it, it appears to provide uh, a solution to the question of how did novel structures arise? In this case, uh, he is applying this analogy to the origin of proteins. But what's interesting is Maynard Smith, in the very paper, the very same paper, says, hey, there's a problem with this analogy. It suffers from a serious flaw. <clears throat> okay, so... Let's recall a basic logical point. And I, I apologize for this, but it, it's a bit of logic chopping here, but it's very important. Analogies and models are trustworthy to the degree that they genuinely map from one process to another. So let's say we have process A that has dimension P, okay? And we want to understand process B and we're going to map dimension P into dimension Q of process B 
So that those two dimensions are causally and structurally identical. A and B as a process, as processes may be very different, but we think that P and Q are close enough in their structure and in their causal relations that we can do a mapping from, from A to B. Okay, it matters critically that P actually does equal Q because that's what we're relying on to go from A. Let's, let's say A is understanding the origin and transformation of genes and proteins and going from that to B, transformation of words in natural language. Okay, we trust our models. We trust our analogies to the degree that those Dimensions P and Q that we've isolated genuinely share causal and structural identities. So if you think about how you use analogies or models, you will find that this is critical. That that when you say, well, that that actually is a good model. It's a simple model for this complex process I'm trying to understand because this key feature is conserved between the two. Now, uh, conversely, you reject an analogy or a model because the key features are not conserved. What's wrong with Maynard Smith's 1970 word-to-word -word transformation? Well, this is actually a screen capture from the Nature paper itself. He goes from the word word to gene by this stepwise single letter transformation. But if you go to the Oxford English Dictionary, this has nothing to do with how the word gene came to be, okay? The OED provides a strong corrective to Maynard Smith's model because if you look at the etymological data that the OED has assembled and look at how words actually enter the English language and how their spelling is transformed over time, what you need to establish the pathway of transformation is first usage. When did the word first appear in an English publication? What was the language of origin? Did it come from a classical language like Latin or Greek, or was it an import from French or something? Uh, what, are the, what are the spellings? How have the spellings been modified? Have the meanings, namely the semantic functions, changed? This little word game, while fun, is entirely irrelevant. The problem is, and Maynard Smith acknowledges this, his word game may have nothing at all to do with how proteins themselves came to be. In fact, when we get back to the starting set, the first words in the evolutionary model, those must be positives, posited as givens or primitives beyond which we cannot see. So in the paper, in Nature, uh, Maynard Smith says, there's a difficulty that remains in explaining the origin of life. That is, in explaining the origin of the first functional proteins together with the genetic mechanism for producing them. It is difficult to understand how the first pr proteins arose. That was 1970. What is that? Uh, gosh, uh, 50, 53 years ago. Um, it's the same problem exists today. The origin of the original set of starting proteins is equally puzzling today as it was when Maynard Smith wrote uh, wrote this statement. Why? Well, we come up on a pair of horizons that, uh, that I call the homology horizons. Evolutionary explanation in biology rests on really two causal processes. Copy, we can call them copy, template causation, and vary, modify structure. So you begin with a starting template, you copy it, and you modify it in the copying process. But if you think about this, as you go back in time, you have to have a starting set of templates. The causal process vary cannot occur without a template on which it operates. So copy and vary, copy and vary, copy and vary, which is most of evolutionary explanation, presupposes a starting set of templates on which that process is going to operate. And uh, Maynard Smith himself, in his own paper in Nature, recognizes this, that real words, 
Real English words do not transfer even transform even remotely like his word game. In other words, dimension P is not is not uh, congruent in the way that we need it to be with dimension Q for the analogy to work. So his model is superficially attractive, but it's wrong. Uh, Subor, Subor, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. I was just writing. A, I, what I believe is a very intelligent question. <laughs> um, it occurs to me that uh, I'm not even at the halfway point in this presentation. Yeah. And uh, um, rather than just keep the viewers and listeners just stringing along for another hour, it might be wise to stop here. Mm -hmm. this, this is a lot of material already. Yeah. And uh, I'm not even at the halfway point. I apologize for that. This has been a problem for me, I'll be honest, for, for decades as a public speaker is that I pack too much material into a single presentation and I run up against time limits. So my suggestion is let's stop here. Yeah. Uh, next week uh, on the 23rd, we can pick up the second part of this. So th this will be a four part series <laughs> unintentionally. I wanted to do it in three, but I also recognize that, that pay, you know, people have limited time and, and attention. So yeah, this is a natural stopping point. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, the thing is just as you, um, called out my name. I was trying to summarize the most important point as a question uh, or a statement, um, and I was just finishing typing when when you uh, when you called out my name. So, <laughs> what, what what I wanted to summarize today's upshot as is observational access to things like initial templates is not a problem if you believe in methodological naturalism. <laughs> that, that in essence is, you know, one of the takeaways here. Well. Can you uh, can you uh, elaborate for me? Because I'm not sure I agree with you. Okay, so what I mean is observational access is something that you spoke about, right? That, right. that is something we don't have, right? And the initial templates to begin with gene and then go to whatever word, you need to have those templates in order to see, you know, uh, you can't just go with, okay, we're going to assume copy and vary and therefore we're going to get here. We need to know the sequences. We need to know... Uh, the, the historical uh, pathway. But if you believe from the onset um, in the statement of, I'm going to go, I, I don't remember who you quoted, but I took, I took this down because I thought this was important. If you begin off with entities are homologous, however different they become. <laughs> so <laughs> if, you begin, if you begin off with that, then it doesn't really matter if you have observational access. I mean that that seems to be one of the points that I so um, but only in the barest logical sense. What yeah. you would do in a case like that is say it's an existentially quantified claim. Some thing, uh, some sequence existed that was the original progenitor of the one that I observed today. Yeah. Um, the problem with existentially quantified claims, though, is they they tend to be empirically empty. So I say to you, uh, yeah. well, you know, I here's the gene I see today and its protein product. So let's run the story back in time. And was it what, you know, step by step, we'll just take it generation by generation backwards in time. And what happens is your ability as a biologist actually to describe what you're what you're postulating disappears yeah and uh I, that's a case in which there's actually no science because yeah. science depends on being able to specify what you're claiming so if i i run my story back in time step by step by step by step Either the sequence will remain largely the same and its protein product will remain largely the same, or it will vary. As it varies, we know as a matter of observation that proteins, but by their very nature, are constrained in their variation. Certain amino acids can, uh, can mutate with greater uh, facility than others. They're not as critical to function. But... It's well established that, that if you mutate an, an amino acid sequence sufficiently, 
you will suddenly fall off a cliff. Function will disappear. Yeah. The thing won't even fold. So I say to my, my, you know, methodological naturalist, I will, I will walk with you down this pathway backwards in time. All I ask is that you describe what's happening at each step. Yeah. And at that point, uh, uh, either he can describe it or he can't. Yeah. And in fact, it's so funny that you, you brought this up because the very next section of the talk, which we'll get to next Thursday, because I overpacked. It's like packing for a trip and having way too much luggage. I overpacked. Yeah. Uh, the very next part of the talk takes up what you were saying. Yeah. Uh, and we come to what I call these homology horizons that yeah. are quite striking. And you see them, you see them everywhere in molecular evolution literature where suddenly it's no longer possible to describe the entity that was supposed to give rise to the one that you observe yeah. for, for a pair of reasons that we'll come to next week. Brilliant. Um, just a small point. Uh, next week, I won't be available. I'm going to be at, for about a month. We're going to have to take a break because of Ramadan. <laughs> and uh, we, we have um, quite a few things um, to cover. So I think what we'll do is we'll catch up. We'll probably end up doing another four parts based upon my assumption of how this is panning out. Um, and we could start near the end of April and then carry on through to May. Um, one of the things I just wanted you to speak about briefly before we end the session is, and I really love this, and you must have spent a bit of time on this, right? The house of evolution and all the different, you know, the, the, the different residents who aren't getting along. So just to sort of summarize for the audience, obviously we've got biological descent, observations of similarities, which is out there. Uh, universal common ancestry, a bush of life, orchid of life, whatever it is, and then causation via undirected physical processes. So you've got all these different uh, people, but one of, one of the things that you said, which I really want you to highlight, is homology and similarities may never have coffee together in the house. Like, can you just... Yes. Get... Yeah. And, and, um, and that's because of the, the uh, under, to use philosophical language from the philosophy of science, the underdetermination of the cause of similarity, uh, or let me put it, let me put it more precisely. Similarity as an observed phenomenon underdetermines its cause. Yeah. So yep. Uh, yep. I actually, I'll put in a slide next time that, that makes this clear. So we've got similarity is what we see right here, my right hand. My left hand are the possible causes for that. Well, as we saw with the, the hammerhead ribozyme, the hammerhead ribozyme is chemically determined by a particular function, the self-cleaving reaction that they selected for. Yep. You end up with the same structure, not because of descent from a common ancestor, but because you're being deterministically funneled down towards a particular solution. So if the hammerhead ribozyme is living in the house of evolution, he never has to have coffee with or even see pass in the hallway material yeah. descent yeah. because he's perfectly adequately explained causally by the chemistry. Yeah. And yeah. it may be the case that many apparently homologous I say apparently homologous in the sense of Darwin's definition, uh, patterns have their explanation other than the material descent. Let me give you one example from classical anatomy. Yep. You have the, the one, two, five pattern of the, yep. of the vertebrate limb. Yep. Classical example of homology. Well, a few years ago, I was thinking about this and I thought, what would happen if you had two bones here? the element proximal to the trunk, right? Uh, instead of one. What would happen if you had two bones is you would form a tripod or not a tripod, but a triangle. And the range of motion, freedom of motion of the next element, which is two bones here and then five. If there's two bones here, your ability to move goes down dramatically. Yeah. 
just just from the geometry. Yeah. And in a case like that, you would say, why do we have the one, two, five pattern in vertebrates? It may be because that is actually optimal for the range of motion required by uh, tetrapods. Yeah. What did Darwin do? In the origin, Darwin quoted Owen. And he said, there's no possible way to explain this other than material descent. It's, it's just obviously suboptimal. And it's one of the passages in the, in the origin. I mean, I don't, don't like to think of Darwin as an enemy because he did have many breakthroughs. Maybe that's a talk we can do sometime in the future. Yeah. But this is a place when I'm reading Darwin that my, I just feel my rage rising. <laughs> because he's relying on the authority of Owen rather than sitting down and thinking, well, is there maybe a good functional reason for that? Yeah. That would not be related necessarily to descent. So you can have these, you can have these concepts and theoretic commitments. I mean, the house of evolution is big, right? You can have one guy living in the West Wing and he just never sees <laughs> some of these yeah. other concepts. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're gonna unpack some of this stuff next time, Paul. You're gonna have more time to turn this into another four. Uh, session it's a four-parter. So now it's a, now it's a four-parter. Yeah, it is. It is. I, I apologize for that. No. Really, I'm, I'm sorry for the for the viewer because some of the best stuff was in the second half. Uh, well, there's a lot of very good stuff here. We need to digest first. And um, what normally happens with these streams is once I put the references up and people are having a discussion in the comment section, you know, people they di digest it a lot more. So thank you so much for your time, Paul. Yes, I'll send yes. you. I'll send you the references and thank uh, you, Sibor. Yeah, there was one part I wanted to laugh at, but I'm glad I was muted. And it's it's when you were making a really profound point and your cat was concurring in the background. I don't know if you heard that. <laughs> oh, I hear him. I hear them. He gets he gets very. He, he expects to be fed right about now. And right, that's, that's what he was complaining about. <laughs> uh, we'll let you off then. Cheers, Paul. Take care.